If God really exists, why, in heaven's name, does God not prove that he exists instead of just leaving us here in our terrible uncertainty? That is how Frederick Buechner begins his essay, Message in the Stars. He then proceeds to say that he sometimes wondered what exactly would happen if, in fact, God did do exactly what we say we want. If he gave us irrefutable proof of his existence, and and he writes, Suppose that God were to take that great dim river of the Milky Way, as we see it from down here, flowing across the night sky, and were to brighten it up a little, and then rearrange it so that all of a sudden, one night, the world would step outside, look up at the heavens, and not see the usual haphazard scattering of stars. But written out in letters, light years tall, the sentence I really exist, or God is, with like stars and and moons to dot the I's and tails of comets to cross the T's. What then? How would the world respond? And he says, well, I imagine some like sinking to their knees in the tall grass behind their garage. Not because they're particularly religious, but just it seems natural. Like, what else would you do? And some running into their house in terror, afraid of judgment, or overwhelmed, or just unable to cope. Some, he says, would surely be weeping tears of regret, and others, though, would surely be filled with a wild surge of hope. He imagined churches having to fill football stadiums and open fields. Wars would cease. Crime would stop. And he writes, a a kind of uncanny hush would fall over the world. But, he writes, as my story ended, I'm afraid that, in honesty, I'd have to suggest something else. That years would go by, and in order to convince every single person on planet Earth, God would have to do something crazy. In order to convince them that it wasn't just a, like a one in billion freak of nature, he would take those same words and he would rewrite them in different languages. And then he'd have to like add like these massive colors and then this beautiful celestial music that was so overwhelming that eventually even the last hardened skeptic would be convinced. Now, every human being on planet Earth would know without a doubt God exists. If this were a movie, he says... That's the moment when the camera would pan to one child looking up at the night sky. You'd see the reflection of the stars in his eyes. You can hear in the background this overwhelmingly beautiful celestial music. And he says, just then, the child turns to his father, or or maybe to God himself, and says, so what if God exists? What difference does that make? He says, and in the twinkling of an eye, the message would fade away for good. The celestial music would be heard no more. Or maybe, maybe it would continue for centuries to come, but it would no longer make any difference. The message in the stars. So we all say we want, we we think we want, Proof of God's existence. Like, that's what we really need. But is that what we really need? Is that what we really want, even? Beekner seems to think that you can confess without a shadow of doubt, without a hint of irony. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You can confess that and still not know God as Father. You can know for sure that God exists and live as though he does not. Which is to suggest that what we most need is probably not a rational proof that he exists, but proof that he cares, proof that he is with us, proof that he is good, and that is a different kind of proof. So in the um, 11th and 12th centuries, the church theologians had this big debate over the question, how can someone know God? How do we know God? And some, there was a popular view that it was reason. Like you you study all the evidence, that if you study the science and you study history and you study the scriptures and you study your own soul, you can put all these pieces together and through that puzzle work you put together and you say, ah, there must be a God. And then you reach out towards God in faith that it was, in their phrasing, Understanding, seeking faith. 
But then Anselm of Canterbury came along and said, really? You think that you can rationally come up with one God who exists in three persons? That, that makes sense to you. You think that you, reason will lead you to believe that God, who sustains all things and holds all things together, became a baby who could not like, hold up his own head or feed himself? You, you think you could logically deduce that? He says, no, it is faith-seeking reason that God exists outside of space and time and that we can't, we, there's no scrutiny, there's no human reason that can re probe those depths. So it is by faith, by believing what he says, that we can begin to understand him more and more. Faith comes first and then understanding pursues. And that, that is helpful. But then, then comes along a guy named Bernard of Clairvaux. And I have to confess, I have a man crush on Bernard of Clairvaux. He's like my favorite monk. Okay, so. He takes it one step further and says, that's right, that's right, that's good, that's helpful. Anselm's right. He just told us how to get the right answer about God. That's orthodoxy, right thinking. But if you really want, want to know God, it is not enough to have the right answer. He says you need experience-seeking understanding. Now, let me, um, let me contextualize this. Bernard is not saying that my feelings somehow define reality. He was a medieval monk. He, he wouldn't even know what to do with that like postmodern drivel. Right? <laughs> he means that if you really want to know the God who is three in one, it is not enough to understand the doctrine of Trinity. You have to meet him. You have to feel his presence. You have to get wrapped up in that love between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that until you experience that, you can't say you know him. In the words of King David, you have to taste and see that the Lord is good. And that, that is a different way of knowing and that is a different kind of proof. So over the past few weeks, um, I have somewhat emphatically suggested that the modern vision of life is less than adequate. <laughs> I've used words like self-defeating, absurd, chaotic, formless, and void. That this, this is the vision, the modern vision of life. It is dragging us under, and yet, and yet, and yet, I hate it. And yet, I find myself in it. Like, it's home. It's the only home we've ever known. And if, if you grew up in the same world I grew up in, that's the world you know, too. So the question that I've been pressing into is, what do we do? Like, how do we begin to cultivate a different vision of life? And we've seen over the last few weeks that according to at least the Desert Fathers, there was an ancient resource available to us that we've, we've kind of forgotten about, we've lost track of. It's called the book of creation. That, there, that creation itself is a book written by God, and if we would learn how to read it the way like Moses and David and Paul read it, that we would, we would cultivate a vision of life that bursts forth in beauty, glory, joy, gratitude, fullness, glory, all. So today, I want to explore this a little bit further. And specifically, I want to explore why, like, Beekner and Bernard and Jonathan Edwards and the Apostle Paul and King David and Moses, we could add to this, why, why they seem to think that if we want to cultivate a different vision of life, we, we don't just need some good rational explanation. It's not just propositional truth you need, that we need a different kind of proof. That if we want to change the way we view the world, it's not just a textbook that you need. It's something you need to experience. You need to taste and see that the Lord is good. So here's the question. How does our experience of God's goodness in creation, or lack thereof, shape our vision of life? That's the question. How does our experience of God's goodness in creation, how does that actually shape our vision of life? To say it a little bit more bluntly and put it in the context we've been speaking, I am convinced that the modern secular vision of life has blinded us to the profound goodness of creation. It's blinded us to the profound goodness of what God is doing all around us in, in rocks, in trees, in mangoes, in our own bodies. And if we hope to cultivate the vision of life that like Moses spoke of and David sang about and Paul preached and Jesus lived, then we have to rediscover the goodness of God in all things. 
The word for this, this experiencing the goodness of God in things, there's a word for this. We call it gratitude. And just, I, I don't want to lose you in the weeds. I want to tell you where we're going today. Here's my thesis, and it's going to sound a little hyperbolic or bombastic, but I, I promise you, I'm, I do not think I'm overstating this. Our experience, your experience of the goodness of God in all things, this thing we call gratitude, your gratitude, or lack thereof, profoundly shapes our vision of life, our relationship with creation, our understanding of ourselves, our relationship with God, and it literally reshapes our brains. So, we're going to start today in Romans chapter 1. It's page 911 in your pew Bible if you want to follow along. And, and we'll, we'll tack on a few other texts. But I want to start here because in this text, it's a classic. The Apostle Paul is going to force us to some very, very um, big, big conclusions about this topic of gratitude, about how gratitude or the lack thereof shapes our vision of life, our vision of reality. Starts Romans chapter 1, verse 18, begins like this. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. We're like, Paul, what it, what, where is this coming from? God's wrath is being revealed? What does this mean? Why is God so wrathful? And he explains. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So you woke up this morning to a world you did not create. You smell fresh coffee brewing. You, you hear birds chirping. You, you, you watch a sunrise in spectacular beauty. You look in the mirror at your own body. And there are literally tens, millions of things happening in your body that you don't even understand, much less control. And then you look out the window at a universe where there are tens of trillions of things necessary for this moment to exist right now that you don't even understand, much less control. You look around at the people in your life, your friends, your family, each person unique, each person a living soul, a, a miracle of creation. You walk out into a world of trees and hills and oceans and mountain valleys in which God has planted millions of flowers that no human eye will ever see. You go out and it is impossible to not read the book of creation, Paul says. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So Paul says, um, if, when, when you wake up and you experience this world, if something within you does not cry out, thank you, then something is deeply wrong, profoundly wrong. You, you're suppressing something. You're holding back something. You're, you're missing out on something. And, and listen to this. He says, the problem is not a lack of evidence. Not really. More evidence would not fix what's broken in our souls. Our problem is not a lack of evidence. Our, our problem, he says, is a lack of gratitude. This, this lack of gratitude, he says, uh, makes our thinking futile, um, which we could say absurd or chaotic. It, it makes you do things like take an empty room and set an apple on a plastic table and call that art. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it darkens your mind so that, so that you feel like you have to light a lantern in the middle of the morning because you can't see anything good anymore. It's gone. Okay, so 
Paul seems to think that gratitude is a really, really, really big deal. So we're like, okay, what are you talking about, Paul? Why is gratitude so important? So if you were to not come to this Paul, but come to this Paul, I'd say, I know who you need to talk to. So tomorrow morning, we hop on a plane, and we're going to fly here, University of California, Davis. If we leave in the morning, we might be able to make that for, you know, late lunch, early uh, dinner. And we sit down with Dr. Robert Amons. He's, he's one of my favorite neuroscientists. My favorite is actually Jen, who plays in our band, but one of our favorites. And so um, sit down, and this guy is considered to be, broadly, the, the world's leading expert on gratitude. I'm like, we got to talk to this guy. If we have questions about gratitude, he's the guy you go to. So we say, Dr. Raymond, what is gratitude? And he says, ah, it's two things. Direct quote here. Number one, it's an affirmation of goodness. We affirm that there are good things in the world, gifts and benefits we've received. Affirmation of goodness. And two, we recognize that the source of this goodness are the sources of this goodness are outside of ourselves. I didn't create this goodness. I didn't just make this up. It's outside of me. And then we're like, okay, that's what gratitude is. Affirmation, it is good. And then I didn't make that up. That this is outside of me. But why is that so important, Dr. Amen? And he's like, ah. Well, I've spent decades of my life researching this, I can tell you. If you are a grateful person, you'll get less sick, 10% fewer stress-related illnesses. You'll have healthier hearts, 10 to 16% lower blood pressure. You'll get better sleep, 10% longer, 15% better. You'll exercise more, one and a half hours more per week. You'll overcome adversity better with lower stress hormone cortisol levels. You will handle stress better. better. You will be more generous with your time and money, 20% more. And he says, and presumably, the opposite's true as well. If you're an ungrateful person, you'll slowly kill yourself. So Dr. Amon's research is the basis for, like, you know, life coaches everywhere prescribe gratitude journaling. Are you familiar with this? This practice of you, you write every day things you're thankful for. This is where it comes from. This is the, 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 the scientific basis of that. And you're like, wow, that's brilliant. But then the Apostle Paul says, all of that is true. But I want to add one more thing to this list of what gratitude or ingratitude can do to your life. The gratitude for the Apostle Paul is being willing to affirm the goodness that's outside of there and that it came from God, not from you. He says, when you take that out of your life, when you don't experience gratitude, then what happens is you construct your own goodness. And he has a word for this. The Bible has a word for this. He calls it idolatry. Verse 22. Although they claim to be wise, they've become fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. It made to look like mortal human being, birds, animals, reptiles. When we can no longer recognize God's definition of good, we no longer affirm that it's good and recognize that it's from God, then we construct our own definition of good. We, we construct our own definition of a, a good identity, a good reality, a good truth. We, we, we find a good just apart from God. And um, whether this is worshiping a literal idol like Baal or Asherah or Shamash of old or worshiping a, a social construct that we now tell everyone in the world, you must bend your knee to my truth. Both, Paul says, these are, these are idols. Either way, it's allowing an unreality, a fiction to rule your life. And this, this does not end well. So God's wrath is being revealed against our country because we are a group of idolaters. And I'm like, oh no, Paul, God's wrath is being revealed. What does this mean? Is is God going to like send like burning sulfur on us like he did with Sodom? Or is he going to, earth going to open up its mouth and swallow us whole the way it did in number 16 with Korah's rebellion? What's going to happen? What is the wrath of God you're talking about? And he says, therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. God's wrath is revealed in this. He gives us exactly what we want. He gives us the desires of our hearts. The sinful desires of our hearts. Do you hear what the apostles saying here? 
sometimes God's grace looks like unfulfilled desire. Sometimes God's wrath in your life looks like getting exactly what you want. That, that God's wrath might mean people fulfilling everything they want. That he says he lets them construct their own identity. He lets them define what's good for them. He lets them ex- have exactly what their sinful hearts desire. And the results are devastating. And that, that's the wrath of God. Famously, this text then goes into when God gives them over to their own desires, it starts with sexual desires. That's where it tends to start in our society as well. But then it cascades, and I I want you to just hear this. This cascades into society itself, just coming to part of the seams, into um, the language we talked about last week, um, formlessness and void, tohu and bohu. Listen, they've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They're gossip, slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They're senseless, fatherless, heartless, ruthless. As a parent, I love that he, he slipped in there. They disobey their parents. I just, you know. But get this. When they lose, when we lose the connection between goodness and God, when we refuse to affirm the goodness of God in creation, our lives collapse into formlessness and void, into tohu and bohu, into chaos and absurdity. And here, here's the aha. Here's where where we begin to pick up that gratitude is much, much bigger than like some sentimental feeling I have. It's much more fundamental to reality than than we might ever guess. That is much more important than we first imagined. That according to Paul, gratitude or the lack thereof shapes our vision of life, our relationship with God, and ultimately our eternity. Do you hear that? So why, why, Paul? Why do you think that our experience of creation is so important? Um, why, why is the Apostle Paul think that our experience of God's goodness in creation is so important? I'm guessing that it has something to do with how God experiences creation. So Genesis chapter 1, we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and void, tohu and bohu. Darkness was over the f- surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke it into existence, and God saw that the light was good. He affirmed its goodness. That God looks at what he's created and says, now that is good. And it's not just day one, you know, day two, and it's good. And day three, it's good. And day four, and day five, and to finally day six, he's finished creation, set humanity over top of it. And he says, what does he say? It is very good. It is tov, tov, good, good, double good. That according to Moses, according to God's word, goodness is not a preference or a sentiment. It is a created reality. It is every bit as real as stars and pomegranates and the law of gravity. So in case we miss this point, James, the brother of Jesus, will warn us. He's warning us. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Don't be deceived. This world is trying to to deceive you, pervert you. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. Paul, writing to Timothy, who was in Ephesus at the time, and they were rejecting the inherent goodness of things like marriage, sex, and certain foods. So he says, now that, that is, um, uh, uh, First Timothy chapter 4, he says, that is something taught by demons. That, that's demonic. Why? For everything God created is good. Not because I think it's good, because he says it's good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Do you, do you hear the language? It's good, and then I affirm that it's good. That they, God's statement of goodness is echoed by my statement of goodness that has felt my heart springs up into the words, thank you. 
that I receive everything in life as gift from God. Our experience of goodness, what we call gratitude, is not just how I feel about things. It is an experience of the deepest reality. It is seen and experiencing creation the way God sees it. It is agreeing with God, agreeing with reality itself. It's good. So Meister Eckhart, a 13th century theologian, I wouldn't necessarily recommend everything he writes, but there's a few things that he gets really, really right. He's got a sermon, sermon number 27, where he's preaching on Philippians chapter 4, where it's like, do not be anxious for anything, right? But with thanksgiving, receive everything as a gift from God. Receive it, as, and, and, and the peace of God will guard your hearts, right? And he's preaching on that, and he concludes, um, here's how he sees gratitude and a relationship with God coming together. If the only prayer you ever say in your entire life is thank you, it'll be enough. According to Meister Eckhart and many of the scriptures, gratitude, this deep gratitude, the kind that wells up in you, that you can hardly put in words, that does something within you, it aligns your soul with God, with reality itself. It pulls you into alignment with the created order, that which is good and true and beautiful. It transforms you. It makes sense of things that no argument could make sense of. Now, this is not to say that everything we experience, we experience is good. It's not. A few years ago, we um, hosted Dr. Jennifer Weissman, a uh, brilliant astrophysicist, and she also happens to be, the, she was the, for years the head of the Hubble Telescope Project, all right? So she's speaking specifically on like faith, science, stars, but then she, she takes a little shortcut and says, uh, let's talk about volcanoes for a moment. And I'm like, volcanoes? Now, usually people don't think of volcanoes as good, like, not at least in the way you think of, like, a kitten or a tree or a peach. Good, right? But she, she notes that um, if volcanoes did not continually turn over the crust of the earth, the earth would not continue to support life. That because of volcanoes and plate tectonics, earthquakes, things that people historically loathe, fear, view as chaotic or bad, because of those things, the earth flourishes. In fact, it's because it's only on volcanic soil that you can get um, Kona coffee. And that is Tove. Right? Now, now here, here, this is important. This is where all and gratitude kiss. Until we get a vast picture of what God is doing in the universe, until we get a vast perspective of God himself, we, we can't possibly see that. So maybe by faith we have to say, God, I'm going to trust you that somehow you're going to take this volcano and give me Kona coffee. But we, we, until we get a big perspective, we can't even be open to experiencing everything God made as good. And this is why I would suggest Paul, Moses, James, David are constantly pushing us, pushing us, pushing us. Get a bigger perspective. Get outside of yourself. Look at what God's doing in the universe. Look at what he's doing across time. It is so much bigger than you. So this takes us to Psalm 36. Now, Psalm 36, I'm not just pointing to the psalm because it proves my point, but I'm pointing to the psalm because I'm pretty sure the Apostle Paul was reading this psalm when he wrote Romans chapter 1. Because in Romans chapter 3, he actually quotes this psalm directly. So, so in Psalm 36, a psalm of David, we read this. An oracle is within my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wickedness. David's like, I feel like God has given me a word. He's put something on my heart that explains why people in the world think and live and act in such a self-destructive and dehumanizing way. And here's what it is. There is no fear of God before his eyes. So fear of God, we said this last week, fear of God, all, same thing. We're talking about the same thing here. 
Last week, we said psychologists describe awe as a perceived vastness coupled with a need for accommodation. It's, it's vast. It's like standing before an ocean or before a mountain range or, or looking up at a giant eucalyptus tree and, and something in you feel so small and yet so deeply connected, so profoundly alive. That you then have your mind blown, this need for accommodation, that you realize my view of the world is just way, way, way too small. Life is so much bigger, so much more mysterious, so much greater than I can even imagine. David says that, that sense, if you never experience that in the presence of God, if you never experience that in God's creation, then you will no longer be able to see life for what it is. You will no longer value life the way it truly is to be valued. So in the late 1800s, about the same time that Nietzsche was in Germany writing about some madman running around the marketplace with a lantern, about the same time, um, there was a famous German evolutionary biologist named Ernst Haeckel. All right? He wrote, quite famously, this. He said, the cell consists of matter composed chiefly of carbon with an admixture of hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur, these component parts properly united produce the soul and body of the animated world and suitably nourished become man. That's what a man is. With this, this, with this single argument, the mystery of the universe is explained, the deity annulled, and a new era of infinite knowledge ushered in. <laughs> okay, so let's say we take this quote seriously. This is the nothing but argument, right? Like if you can just say the chemical composition of something, I've now explained it to you. That's it. Humans, we know that humans are dust you are and to dust you will become. So humans are just dust. You put them together and you've explained. You've explained away the mystery of all things. Haeckel thinks that because he can describe the chemical composition of the human body, he has explained away the mystery of human life. So let's ask Haeckel another question. Like, Haeckel, okay, let's take this logic, help explain, you say you've explained the mystery of everything, explain to me, why is the Mona Lisa so mysterious? And so he breaks out his chemical re refractor and says, ah, I'm now going to tell you the chemical composition of each of the paints da Vinci used. And now if you just take that and you understand the sfumato, however you say that in Italian, technique that he used, you've now, I've now explained the mystery of the Mona Lisa. The, the Mona Lisa is nothing but paint properly mixed, suitably applied. That explains everything. To which I say, are you serious? Are you serious right now? Do you really believe that? So I, I might think that this is funny if I didn't know that Haeckel's vision of life would then give birth to the atrocities of Nazism. David says there, there's no fear of God before his eyes. That Haeckel does not have, he lacks the all. And this leads to a complete lack of self-knowledge. Verse 2, for in his own eyes he flatters himself too much to detect or hate his sin. That the lack of all leads to a lack of self-knowledge. That, that when you experience all, we talked about this last week, Jonathan Haidt describes it this way. He says you become a small self you realize that you are just part of something so much bigger than you. But then you begin to realize that your story is part of a much, much bigger story. But this doesn't make your story less. It makes it meaningful. You realize that you are just a little, little piece of something infinite, something unimaginably big. But this does not make you less. It makes you more. That all frees us from the fiction that my, defi my desires define reality. It frees us from the lie that I can somehow construct my own identity or give myself value. You don't have to. You're part of something already. It's given to you. It's a gift. All makes you realize that you cannot even comprehend, much less control, life. And that knowing how small you are, knowing that you cannot possibly comprehend it all, that is why the scriptures speak everywhere about fear of the Lord. Oh, is the beginning of wisdom. 
when we lose this perspective, we flatter ourselves into thinking that I can somehow construct my own identity, I can somehow do it myself, and we, it leads to our own destruction. The inverse of this, we see it in the second half of the psalm. David then gives us his vision of standing before in all before God. And what does that lead to? Look at verse 5 and following. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies, your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your, your justice like the great deep. Lord, you preserve both man and beast. How priceless is your unfailing love. How high and low among men find their refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Like the, only, the, the light of my life, the only reason I know anything truly is because I've experienced you. I've experienced you that this, he, perf, he affirms the profound goodness in creation and that it doesn't come from him, it comes from God. And here we see that all bursts forth in gratitude. That gratitude is not just a nice feeling, it's not just sentimental. That gratitude is how we are transformed. It's how we come to know God and ourselves. It's how we align ourselves, our lives, our souls with reality itself. Now, I realize this sounds hyperbolic. Paul, are you saying that if we just say thank you somehow, I'm going to get a different vision of life? Maybe. I might be saying that. So let's, um, let's take this out of the world of theology and God. That's way too squishy. Let's talk about something that we can um, wrap our hands around, something we can understand. Neuroscience. Huh? So last year I stumbled on a podcast with Andrew Hooperman. He's like my third favorite neuroscientist. He's a neuroscientist at Stanford, and he has a podcast called The Science of Gratitude. So Huberman, he builds off Robert Amon's research and says, yes, 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 all of that's good. Gratitude, gratefulness, it gives you a better life. It does all these health benefits. There's, you should practice gratitude. But, but he says, um, but this old idea of just practicing a gratitude journal, he says, that's not the best science now. We know, we know more. And he points to the researchers of Glenn and Fox, Antonio Damasio, uh, they did this, this series of experiments um, where they, they measured at a neurobiological level what was happening in the brain when you experience gratitude. And to quote Fox, they asked the question, how do you make a brain, not a person, how do you make a brain grateful? How do you actually transform a brain? So this science, let me just say up front, it's way beyond me. But here's the parts that, here's the low-hanging fruit. So do you know what neuroplasticity is? that our brains have the ability to change and grow with use. Like, they're not like fixed, but we can grow areas of our brain, we can shrink areas of our brain with time. The, the famous example is pornography. Um, the, the neural pathways used to process porn, the, the more we use them, the more defined, the faster, the easier they become to use. So it's like you think of like a pathway through a woods. At first, it's just like a hiking trail, but if you go over it again and again and again, soon it becomes a superhighway, that if you look at porn enough, it just, your brain is rehardwired to process things like that, so much so that every interaction, the first thing, the natural, your second nature becomes to process things like pornography, to look at everyone as the object of lust, that it literally reformats your brain. As an aside, not the topic today, but if, if this is your struggle, you're not alone and there is help. Uh, Denny Krikski in our church, he runs a ministry, a sexual wholeness ministry called Made New by Christ. I would strongly recommend that you check it out, talk to me, I can point him to you, or you can find him on our website. That is not the point, though. The point is neuroplasticity. You can change your brain, which changes how you view the world. The same is true, thankfully, with gratitude. Gratitude. Gratitude triggers in, in you, in a good way, your pro-social network. So it triggers the pro-social network. That, and so this is what makes you feel generous, kind, other-centered, hopeful, helpful. The more you practice gratitude, the more this neural network develops. The more you will find it second nature to experience all of life as good, as gift. 
So the more you practice this, the easier it is to just process everything through that lens. But Fox and Damasio, they discovered that the best way to do this is not simply to list out objects or things in your life. Gratitude journaling, it's okay, but that doesn't actually trigger the pro-social networking you bring. What you need to do, if you want to do that, get this, if you want to hack your neurobiology, the way to reformat your brain is, get this, through story. They, they're like, okay, get this, if you want to really change your brain with gratitude, you need to hear a story that generates gratitude in you. You need to hear the story about Corey Ten Boone's family and how they went to extremes, extreme risk to taking Jews and protect them from the Nazis, even at risk of their own lives. And you need to feel that. You need to experience that. That's what they did in the experiment. They told stories about Holocaust survivors who, who sacrificially helped others. But, but they, they tell you, this, this, it's not limited to that. Any story of gratitude will do, but it has to be a story because our brains are built for story that if you just list things that you're grateful for, nowhere near the benefits. So once you have that story, though, you don't have to recall the entire story. All they, they said in order to trigger the pro-social neural network, all you have to do is recount the story and feel into it. Like, remember how you felt in that for about 60 seconds. For about 60 seconds a day, you can reformat your brain for gratitude. Wow. The second thing that they noted is that when people heard these stories, their heartbeat and th their breathing rate got in sync. So like right now, like, you know, everyone's heartbeat might be going at different rates, but as we tell a story, slowly, one by one, all of our heartbeats get into sync. Now here's the bizarre thing though. It's not just when everyone's hearing the same story at the same time, that I could go on Tuesday into Philly and tell someone a story and their heartbeat and their breathing would get into a certain rhythm. And then I could fly out to LA on Wednesday and tell a completely different person the same story and their heartbeat and their breathing would get in the exact same rhythm bizarre. The stories of gratitude don't just make us feel more connected to one another. They literally sink our heartbeats and our breathing. So I heard this and I thought, not this. It's interesting. So we pray, God, I just want a little evidence that you exist. Give me some proof. Like, heal me. Heal the division in a world. Give me a new life. Make me healthier. Give me a good night's sleep. Take away my anxiety. But he doesn't answer any of those prayers. He gives us nothing. Instead, he just drops this book from the sky, and it's full of stories. All he gives us is a bunch of stories to read. Stories about a God who saves his people in the wilderness. Stories about a God who meets a king named David and miraculously saves him. Stories about a guy named Jesus. Like he shows up at this wedding and it's a disaster. It's, it's going to end in total shame for the family. But Jesus then um, turns the water into wine, saves the family, saves the wedding. Uh, stories about a leper, this, this guy who's unclean, isolated, untouchable, has been outside of community for who knows how long. And Jesus meets him. And he touches him. But Jesus doesn't become unclean. The man becomes healthy and whole. Uh, stories about a woman, this woman who had this, who knows what was in her past. They said seven demons. And yet somehow Jesus sees in her something and calls her to be a disciple. And he says, you, you're the person that I value. I'm going to tell you First, when I rise from the dead, Mary Magdalene. All we get are some stories. Some stories that when we hear them, it somehow unites our hearts and our breathing so that we're not only connected with one another, but with every person who's heard this story told since the story first came out. Across time, across space, we are united in a great cloud of witnesses. Now, isn't that curious? It made me think, like, what would happen if for just, like, 60 seconds a day we were to stop 
and remember these stories and feel into them what we felt when we first heard those stories. How might that trigger our pro-social neural network or um, transform us by the renewing of our minds? Father, you are greater and bigger and more glorious than we could ask or imagine. God, we, we can't make this stuff up. And we are just trying to catch up with what you're doing in our world, in our lives. God, I pray that you would, you would fill us with the fear of the Lord, with an awe that then bursts forth in the words, thank you, thank you, thank you.